We're reading chapter 15 of The Crossroads. The table fell on Tomas's knees, which made him swear so loudly Abuela must have scolded him from heaven. Tomas tried to raise the surface back to the to table level and continued swearing when it dropped back to the bed level. The mechanism is busted. I can't fix it. And he threw the cushions on the table, flopped on his back, and covered his eyes with his arm. Vita curled up in the crook of his arm, waiting to comfort him whenever he was ready. Jamie stood in the middle of the trailer as helpless as a fish in the desert. His fear of snakes now seemed frivolous. Tomas needed him. He thought about Abuela and what she would do. Are you hungry? He asked. No. Jamie raised his eyebrows and Tomas, the, the Tomas he knew, never turned down food. Have you eaten? No. Jamie took off his shoes and pulled out the cacti spines that had gone through the synthetic leather. The left they left red marks on his foot, but at least it didn't hurt anymore when he moved. There wasn't much on the food front. Between Abuela and now Don, grocery shopping hadn't been a priority. He stood on his toes and rummaged through a small cabinet above the sink. He found a packet of sardines in the back. In the waist-high fridge, Donna Chichi had left them a soft goat cheese. And in the front door and the door stood a half-eaten jar of homemade red jam. The letters were faded, but Jamie could just make out the word. He couldn't know the word and figured it must be Mexican for some kind of red berry. He opened the lid and ran his pinky along the rim to taste it. Sour, but sweet at the same time. Perfect. He fixed himself and Tomas some crackers with cheese, some with jam and some with both. He held the plate to Tomas so Vita wouldn't get, get it and bossed his older brother like his grandmother would have done. Eat, it'll make you feel better. Tomas shifted his arm, covering his face, and glared at Jamie with one eye. But then he sighed and took the plate out of Jamie's hand as he sat up. Does this mean that Mr. George doesn't think Don is coming back? Jamie asked as he nibbled on a cracker. It means there's there's too much work for me and Quito to finish calving season on our own, even with Mr. George here. Tomas popped the whole cracker in his mouth and pulled out the phone to check the time. With a full mouth, he made the sound like he remembered something he had to wait, had to wait and he swallow, uh, swallowed to speak. I got you something. A plastic bag sat by the door. Tomas leaned over the bed and pulled out two smartphones in hard plastic boxes. One for you and Angela. Pero, I don't need a phone. Jamie held the box, not even sure what to do with it. It wasn't as if he had any friends to contact. I want you to keep it with you anyway. Take it to school, and when you leave the trailer, Donna Chichi accidentally left the landline off the hook and it just about killed me when I couldn't contact you last night. Jamie turned the plastic packaging over. The black screen shined and glared at him like a mini television or a security camera. We can't afford it. Already Tomas had spent too much on them. When Jamie asked if they could buy a mango last time they were at the grocery store, Tomas had looked at the price and shook his head no. Such a fancy phone had to cost millions more than a mango, but any extra money they had should go to Guatemala. Tomas tilted his head from one side to the other like he didn't want to admit that Jamie was right. I opened a family plan. It's a bit more than what I was already paying, but I'll give me, it'll give me peace of mind that we can reach each other when we need to. Here, I'll set the language to Spanish and program our numbers into it. Tomas showed him how to use it with taps and swipes. Once Tomas finished, he headed, handed the phone over to Jamie, who threw it in his school bag like a hot potato. If he couldn't even get in contact with his family in Guatemala, then what was the point? Angela's reaction to a phone when she got home was completely different. She clutched it to her chest and stared at Tomas like it was some kind of god. You got me an iPhone? Tomas shook his head. No, it's the free phone they give me with the plan. 
Angela looked it over carefully before turning it, turning it on. The fact that it was, wasn't worth several hundred dollars didn't seem to bother. How many minutes can I use? Call and text as much as you want to people here. Guatemala, of course, costs extra. But there's only 500 megabytes of data per month. So save that for emails or Skyping your parents and don't download music or anything unless you have Wi-Fi hotspot. Angela didn't seem to have heard a thing beyond as much as you want. She squealed like Cinderella getting to, to go, on the ball, uh, go to the ball before lunging at Tomas for a huge hug. Once she released him, she dug through the front pocket of her bag and pulled out a sheet with phone numbers. Like an old pro, she starting added numbers to the phone without having to be shown how. Within minutes, her phone beeped with the arrival of new messages from her friends. Show off. Maybe Jamie should ask Sean if he had, his, had a number, or Carla, though calling a girl on a phone required more nerve than he thought he had. Then he'd have to talk to her in English, and he wasn't ready for that. And he and Sean seemed to do just fine without talking. By the time he got on the bus the next day, Jamie didn't even want to think about phones. Angela's kept beeping with messages all night until Tomas threatened to throw it out into the, in the cow pie, except Tomas had used more explicit words. Angela silenced it then, but a few times while Jamie lay awake, he caught the glare of the phone reflecting against the wall. And all through breakfast, burnt eggs and toast Tomas had cooked. The phone had flashed continuously as if it were breathing. Pulling out his sketchbook, once he sat next to Sean, he turned to, the back, turned to the back side of the last page. He pushed thoughts of flashing and buzzing out of his mind and tried to shut his ears to ignore Angela's rowdy friends in the back. He drew a creature of his own creation, four arms, four stalked eyes, human body complete with belly button, but then wheels like an army tank for legs, Behind the creature, he drew a cactus. He drew the creature again, this time next to the cactus, to show that while the cactus wasn't a tall one, the creature wasn't much taller. Then he drew a close-up of the creature's face, its mouth open, sharp teeth with all four eyes staring at the sky. He couldn't decide on the nose or ears, so he left the creature without, but did add some, a few whiskers around his open mouth. Next to him, Sean pointed at the drawing and then pointed to himself. Jamie passed his sketchbook over with a shrug. Sean didn't ask what the creature was. And not for the first time, Jamie was glad his bus friend never asked Jamie to explain himself. Sean pulled a pencil from his bag and before Jamie realized it, the other boy had scribbled some words on the sketch. Criticism, praise. But then Sean returned to the sketchbook. Jamie saw they were speech bubbles, like a comic strip. Above the first image, Sean had written, I'm so hungry, there's nothing to eat. Jamie smiled. Not only had he understood Sean's words, at least he hoped he did, but the idea of his creature being hungry hadn't even crossed his mind. Over the second drawing with the creature near the cactus, the caption read, at last, food. I know, Jamie couldn't see where this was going and liked it. His eyes shifted over the final close-up drawing. Ouch, it hurts. Save me, Mommy. Jamie laughed. He gave Sean a thumbs up, who returned it with a grin and thumbs up of his own. Jamie flipped to the other side of the page and began the next comic strip panel. Like a manga, they worked the story from the back of the book. And by the time they got to the school, Jamie had drawn and Sean had written two full pages of their comic. What do you want to call our story? Sean wrote on the sketchbook. Jamie looked out the window. The bus had just pulled into the parking lot, leaving about 15 seconds before this, they stopped and had to get off. The Adventures of Sem, Jamie wrote quickly. Sean started correcting his spelling and then wrote back. What is Sem? The bus slowed down. How could Jamie explain? And in only a few seconds before it stopped and they had to get out, Sean and Jamie, Sem, 
Jamie presented it like a math problem, just as the bus hissed to a stop and the word uh, and said the word out loud. Sean read his formula and gave him another thumbs up. After school, Jamie had the sketchbook out by the time Sean sat next to him. He drew the next installment on the right page and then balanced the book between them before moving to the left side while Sean added the text and the pictures on the right. The collaboration worked well, Jamie being left-handed and Sean right-handed. They were able to draw and write simultaneously, frequently pausing to see what the other had done to influence what they would do themselves. By the time the bus stopped in front of Mr. George's ranch road, the creature, Sem, still hadn't learned how to eat cactus, hadn't scared off the deadliest rattlesnake, though Jamie already had plans to bring the rattler back for, for a rematch, and Sem's greatest wish was to learn to ride a stallion, even though his wheels prevented him from sitting astride anything. With Jamie's mind preoccupied with Sem's further adventures, the walk to the trailer went by in an instant. He barely noticed he was back until a voice called out to him in English. Hi there, son. The red-faced cowboy loomed in front of him in a way that made Jamie feel extra short. The gray felt hat cast a shadow over the cowboy's face. Broad shoulders turned into a bigger belly accented by narrow hips with a massive, shiny, silver belt buckle holding up his jeans. His small flip foam was clipped onto his belt next to a revolver. Jamie forced his eyes off the gun and focused on the rancher's boots, which were not only the size of Vita's body, but were made from some scaly leather that could very well have been a rattlesnake. Jamie took a couple of steps back. Do you have a name? Mr. George asked in his loud, booming voice. Jamie, he said in a whisper. Well, Jamie... When someone says hi to you, the polite thing is to say hi back. Jamie scanned the area for Tomas, but couldn't see him. He hadn't understood a word Mr. George had said, but it couldn't have been good. He heard the scolding tone of a man's voice and knew he was in trouble. Sorry, he apologized without knowing what he was apologizing for. He had learned people up here liked that word, and then retreated as fast as his legs could carry him into the trailer. He glanced at the window, no Mr. George, and still no Tomas. Jamie could only hope that whatever he'd done wrong wouldn't cost Tomas his job. According to the request Mr. George made Tomas yesterday, he obviously thought Don was replaceable, even after centuries of working for him, which meant that Tomas, having worked for the rancher only eight years, could likewise be replaced. Heavy boots stomped up the metal steps, and Jamie was sure Mr. George would burst into the trailer. But when the door swung open, it was Tomas with Vita. Come, Mr. George wants to meet you. Tomas stood in the doorframe and motioned outside with a jerk of his head. Jamie crouched down to greet Vita. At least, she didn't think he had done anything wrong. I don't like him. He stares me. Doesn't matter. You still have to treat him with respect. He's my boss, and he's very, being very kind to you to let and you and Angela live here. He hates me. No, he just thought you were rude for staring at him and not saying hi back. Really? That was it? Jamie straightened up and brushed off his school uniform, making sure that there was no dust from the walk to the trailer, and that his shirt was tucked in nicely. The cowboy leaned against the corral fence. He turned to the sound of their steps and Jamie had to stop himself from running away again. The rancher looked even bigger and more intimidating than he had a minute before with the sun now shining on its large red face. He, left, he let his hand hang for another reassurance from Vita, but the dog had trotted off to socialize with the ranch dogs. Jamie took a deep breath, squared his narrow shoulders and held out his hand instead to the rancher. Hello, Mr. George. My name is Jamie. Mr. George nodded slightly before swallowing Jamie's hand in his own beefy paw. Hello, Jamie. Nice to meet you, son. Okay, now what? There wasn't much more he knew how to say in English. And even if he did, he had no idea what to say. What do grown-ups talk about anyway? He looked over to, at Tomas for help, but his brother was staring at the cows. That could work. Cows nice. Jamie wanted to ask if the cows were healthy, but the sentence would have been too complicated. 
cow babies good. That was apparently the right thing to ask. Mr. George responded at length about how pleased he was with the herd this year and a bunch of other stuff Jamie didn't understand. When Tomas responded, he spoke in perfect English. That also didn't help. At some point, the men switched the conversation from cows to the new ranch hands. Jamie only understood that Tomas pulled out his phone and showed the owner emails they received, re ranch hand wanted. Jamie asked his brother a question, but it was Mr. George who answered with a stern look. You're in the United States, son. Speak English here. Jamie felt himself shrinking even smaller than the regular short height. Sorry. Mr. George shook his head. Don't be sorry, just learn what's right. His words pricked like cactus needles embedded up and down his spine. Who's to say that English was right and Spanish wasn't? He had misunderstood when Mrs. said Spanish was the second official language of New Mexico. At any rate, he remembered his teachers back in Guatemala saying that Spanish was the second most popular language in the world after Chinese. If there was anything that wasn't right, it was everyone thinking that people who spoke English were inferior. Mr. George's stern face muscles relaxed a fraction, but just a fraction. If I visit your country, I'll try to speak to you in your language. But here, I want you to speak mine. Understood? Yes, Jamie lied. He hadn't got half of the words. Instead, when he understood, what he understood was that Mr. George liked things done his way, and his way was in English. Part of him wanted to forget he had asked and just returned to the trailer where he could call, try calling home for the millionth time. But what he had to ask was more important. Don, Mr. George interrupted with an answer to the question he thought Jamie had tried to ask. Never, he never learned English, no matter how hard my father and I tried. And now look where it got him, old guy. Again, Jamie didn't understand Mr. George's meaning. The words indicated that Don was detained for not speaking English. At the same time, the tone implied that the rancher cared, but didn't know how to show it. Even more reason, Jamie had to ask, the, ask his question. Make Mr. Un, make Mr. George understand his concern. R ranchers no stay, leave, Don come. He waved his arm as if beckoning someone closer. Under his breath, Tomas muttered, back. Ranchers leave when Don come back. Jamie Lee finally asked what should have been answered ages ago if Mr. George had been such, hadn't been such a snob. Mr. George removed his hat and wiped his brow, even though he wasn't, it wasn't hot enough today for him to sweat. He explained the situation in a sad tone, but his words were too complicated for Jamie to understand. A blank gaze on Jamie's face must have told the rancher Jamie didn't understand because he sighed and nodded at Tomas to translate. We don't know how long the new ranch hand will stay. Mr. George hired an immigration lawyer for Don. They have a trial date set in three weeks. Fantastic, Jamie couldn't believe the great news. So why is he so upset? Tomas turned away, but not enough to hide his sad face. I have a matter, but the lawyer isn't optimistic of his chances. A couple of years ago, it wouldn't have been a problem but now she says everything has changed and judges are almost impossible to persuade. But she's still going to try, right? That's what he's paying her to do. Tomas nodded over to Mr. George, who nodded back as if understanding what Tomas had said. Maybe he did. Jamie's respect for the red-faced cowboy rose a little. Maybe he wasn't as pompous as he came across. Jamie turned back to Mr. George and searched his brain for the right words. I go see Don? But it was Tomas who shook his head, replying in English, no way, you're illegal. I don't want you anywhere near that place. Jamie caught the word illegal like a stab to the heart. Sure, he entered this country without permission, swimming across the river that separated Mexico and the United States. The act might have been illegal, but as a person, he was no different than any other human. How could anyone actually be illegal? 
How could his brother say that? But in front of the boss man wasn't the time to debate with Tomas. He tried a different plan. I write he, him, Tomas corrected automatically. I write him paper. You mean a letter, Mr. George raised his thick gray eyebrows. Yes, Jamie, Jamie thought letter meant letters of the alphabet. Well, he was going to write alphabet letters on a piece of paper, so I guessed it made sense. So then why was Tomas shaking his head slightly no? Mr. George didn't notice and placed his beefy hand on Jamie's shoulder. For the first time, the rancher's defenses came down. I think he'd like that. Mr. George told Tomas to co contact a couple of the guys who'd emailed about the job and then walked to the big house, where scents from Don Chich Donna Chichi's open kitchen window were making even the cows hungry. So he's not even going to wait to see what happens in court? Jamie asked once he knew that the rancher was too far away to scold him for speaking in Spanish. Tomas turned to head back to the trailer with Vita now at his heels. The lines around his eyes deepened with worry and lack of sleep. The court date is not for another three weeks and we still have a couple hundred cows ready to pop. Each calf has to be tagged, dehorned and castrated if they're, if they're boys. Don did the work of two men and even then, Whoever we hire won't have half, won't do half a good a, jo a good as job. Let's keep praying for a miracle that the new hands are temporary. I can help. Tomas draped an arm around his shoulder and drew him close, half affectionately, half teasing. Sure, but you still have to keep going to school. Oh well, it was worth a shot. Why did you shake your head when I mentioned writing Don a letter? I know my English is bad. But I didn't say anything wrong, did I? The sad look returned to Tomas's eyes as he opened the trailer door for them. Of course not. It's a very sweet and thoughtful idea, except that Don doesn't know how to read. He never went to school. Jamie should have guessed. That was often the case with older people in Guatemala as well. Abuela had only attended school until she was nine. Still, a smile crossed Jamie's face, and he reached into his backpack, remembering the bus ride with Sean and the story they had created without saying a thing to each other, and pulled out his sketchbook. Then it's a good thing I know how to write him a letter without any words.